Mark Carnegie, it's a privilege having you on the program this afternoon. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for your time. Let's begin by talking about cryptocurrency. You've recently launched your own fund, the MHC Digital Asset Fund. I want to know, I think you're a bit hesitant about cryptocurrencies to start. What's changed and what's involved in the new fund? Well, I'm still hesitant about Bitcoin, which I really don't like as an asset, but it's the sort of path breaker asset for the overall asset class. I couldn't figure out what it was going to do and how it was going to do it for a long time and it really wasn't until I began to understand the way that DeFi plus smart contracts looked to me to be able to emerge over the next three, four or five years where I felt like there was actually a reason why distributed models of the control in computer networks had a real place in the overall mix. I'd heard some really good arguments about why centralised models were going to work way, way better than decentralised ones, and I got hooked up on that and a distaste for Bitcoin. And in regard to the fund itself, what's your strategy with that and, and where do you want to take it? So basically what we were told by investors was they wanted some way to capture, attempt to capture 70% of the upside of the digital asset um, marketplace, but only suffer 40% of the downside risk. And trying to figure out how to do that really involves some time understanding about how staking works and a whole series of other futures and options protocols where you need to merge traditional finance with crypto finance. And we feel like, at least in the market at the moment, there's opportunities to be able to do that and really provide genuine alpha for our investors. I've done it a different way because I've got some mad rations as my partners, whereas everybody else looks way more mainstream than me. But I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people and decided these were the guys who were the best in terms of understanding the crypto native world, which I have to say, I'm still both cautious about and somewhat skeptical about. You've said previously that investors should allocate 1% to 2% of their net worth into crypto as a hedge. Are you starting to see that happen? So what I said was do not allocate more than 1% to 2%, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't say do it. I said, and then what I've also said to people is, do you think the Fed has broken fiat? Because you've got to start with that position, which is if you think the Federal Reserve's interventions over the last... 12 or 14 months have got to the stage where you've reached a tipping point, then as an investor you've got a natural cascade and hierarchy of things that have to work through, you have to work through as an investor, yeah? And what happened to me was I looked it through, ended up with some Berkshire Hathaway shares, some gold mining shares and some platinum metal. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the time thumb, thumb sucking because I believed there was a case for crypto but couldn't really get myself from the edge of the diving board to jump in the water. What I concluded was obviously as Bitcoin went on a tear, I made a huge, huge mistake and it was two things that happened at the same time, which was realising there really is a there there with this smart contract stuff at the same time as I realised, look, the easy money's got made here, we're going to have to come up with a more sophisticated strategy. And on a personal level, you've had an interesting 12 months with time spent in both New Zealand and Madagascar, of all places. What's your take on the impact of COVID and where have you dedicated your time and energy over the past 12 months? Well, trying to figure out this is the really, really big question because um, as my hero Charlie Munger said over the weekend, if you know what's going on, you have not a clue. Mm -hmm. It is unprecedented times. What exactly is going to be how, you know, the consequences of all the things that we've done over the 12, last 12 months? I'm just not somebody who's in a position to give you any clarity about where we're going from here. How would you evaluate Australia's performance to both the health and the economic consequences of COVID-19? Do you think enough's been done on by Australia compared to globally? Well, I think Australia and New Zealand and a whole series of the shut the doors countries have proved to do what was essentially the St. Louis versus Philadelphia trade in the flu 
in 1918, where the shutdown early has clearly been able to create a magic pudding of better healthcare outcomes as well as better economic outcomes for people. So without a question of a doubt, the decisions that were taken in Australia and New Zealand have proved to be the right ones, as I say, both economically and a healthcare point of view. I think on the economics, one of the big questions is you've got a very strong milk price in New Zealand, a very, very strong iron ore and copper price in Australia. And so we've got lucky with those export revenues that have allowed us to have a relatively stable foreign exchange position during this time. I think the much more complicated question is, given the fact that we didn't lean into vaccination and all of the politics are very much that people don't care about um, reopening, really. The mm -hmm. voters want safety compared to any sort of risked, you know, some amount of risk to reopen. How that's going to play out, I don't know. And I can see people thinking they're going to have this finished by the end of this year, but I think it could go on a lot longer. What's your take on this Australia-China trade war and where do you think it's going to end up? Well, I think it's a huge, huge mistake, mate. I really do. Mm -hmm. I think to sit there and basically jump in the sack with the people that Trump, that were Trump's fellow travellers on this, yeah, it again works for the politics because everybody likes the China bashing. There's really, really good groups of people supporting the whole America at all costs through all the think tanks in Canberra and the rest of the place. Mm. But it strikes me as being an absolutely crazy strategy for Australia and I vastly prefer what the New Zealanders are doing. Given your global credentials as a venture capitalist and private equity investor, which sectors or asset classes other than cryptos do you see potential for gains in the future in? Well, I think, you know, you've got to wonder about the precious metals coming again. So that's clearly the case. I think all of fintech is going to be revolutionised. People are talking about essentially a fintech front end and a crypto back end. And mm -hmm. huge amounts of that, you know, there's 15 points of GDP just go around in the frictional cost of all of that money transfer. And they're just going to eat that. You know, it'll go from 15% to one and a half, you know, to a tenth of that. And that's just going to create so much commerce. I think you see just providing bandwidth and some sort of payment rails to excluded communities, um, plus the idea that they can self teach in rural and excluded communities in the world. I think there's a pulse of productivity coming that people don't understand. Again, hard to work out how to put the trade on to make it work. So lots and lots of people thinking about it. It's clear that you're gonna have big, big changes in places like India and Africa and rural China. But how to make the investment, still not clear to me. I mean, I personally like Alibaba at the moment as another investment stock where it's had all the regulatory hammer whack it, whereas Amazon, it, everyone knows it's coming, but the regulators haven't gone and started doing the interventions in the US in the way they have in China. Now, you were one of the original venture capitalists in Australia. How have you seen the sector grow over time and where do you see the future of the venture capital industry in Australia going? Well, I was more private equity than venture capital. I'd always had my heart on venture capital, never really did it. The tech guys, right, they've done a phenomenal job. They really have. There are a proper Australian ecosystem of technology investors. I would not claim to be somebody who knows that space at all well. I feel like Australia's had huge, huge benefits out of what those people are doing, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, you know, I found myself much more interested in emerging market. It's just emerging markets over time. So I spent more time up in Asia in the 90s and early 2000s than venture capital Australia. Yeah, I've done some deals, but it's not really been my mainstream. Where I suddenly found myself interested was the combination of fintech and some sort of remote lear learning, self-learning combined with um, with tech is the reason why I'm interested in it at the moment. Now let's talk about your background, beginning with your family. Your father is of course the legendary Sir Rod Carnegie AC and your mother was the late mm. Carmen Carnegie. Talk to me about their influence on you growing up. Well, I think there's two different things, which is I hope 
I was given a strong moral compass and a strong sense of responsibility because obviously I grew up privileged um, in Australia and so desire to go back, be an import, you know, a proper um, member of the community and a participant here and that is a big part of what's guided my life, hence the reason that I stood up and talked about more tax for the rich at times when perhaps there were a whole lot of other rich people who didn't feel that, unlike now. So really values and ethics um, are what they um, gave me. I think in business, Dad was always playing the scale hand, the big incumbent, whereas I've been always more interested in people who play the attacker hand, who are trying to change things. So in business, the practicality of my roles has been on the other side to how Dad had his business career. Now, your father's education and business career reads as a roll call of blue chip institutions, Geelong mm. Grammar, Trinity College at the University of mm. Melbourne, Oxford University, MBA mm. at Harvard. He then worked at McKinsey, Rio Tinto, stint yep. at the BCA and ANZ. Talk to me about what lessons he passed on to you. Well, I think the international outlook was an important component of that. So he always saw Australia as having a role in the world. Mm -hmm. And so my career has had elements of that as well. He taught me one other thing, which I thought was really, really valuable in investing. And I have it on my wall, but I can't get anybody to focus on it. <laughs> and he said to me, just make sure you don't play poker with people who are richer than you, <laughs> yeah? and. A huge amount, one of the three things that this guy, Puggy Pearson, who was five times world champion of poker, and lots and lots of investors have on, his, on their wall as well as me, one of the things is correct money management, making sure that you don't risk too much, that you don't get crazy. That's another really, really important lesson. And then he also talked about negotiating styles. Mm -hmm. so. And then for yourself, you studied at Melbourne University, enrolling yeah. in a Bachelor of Science specialising in zoology and animal physiology, an intriguing study area. What, what sort of drove you into that field? I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I had no desire to be in business or follow. I just wanted to go and get on a boat and you know, study the sea and stuff like that. But I got to Melbourne Uni and realised within one week of starting, I was just not going to be a good research scientist. So that was just, <laughs> I ended up like this. But you did graduate and then you went to Oxford University yeah. and studied a, a JD. What was your experience at Oxford and what was it like being up against Boris Johnson at the debating table? Yeah, I mean, you certainly learned some things. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. I've got some lifelong friends um, that are with me to the day out of Oxford. It was a formative experience for me. It's back to this point about I advocate for all of the kids' international um, exposure and time. I just think there's nothing like that time at Oxford or the time when we were all working in New York as giving you a different perspective on the world. You certainly did work in New York. I think you landed there in 1985 and worked for James Wolfenson, the great James Wolfenson. But you also worked at Hudson Conway with mm. Lloyd Williams during your years mm. in London. What did you learn from your time with Lloyd Williams? Lloyd was the quickest, quickest person I've ever seen to reduce something to a betting ticket. Mm. So with a worldview of complexity and form and nobody more successful as far as breeding Melbourne Cup winners and racing them, he just had an extraordinary, extraordinary ability to work away at a business problem to make it simpler and simpler and simpler mm -hmm. and reduce things to his essence. Fast forward to the year 2000 and you launched Carnegie Wiley and Co with John Wiley. When did you first meet John and how did the relationship grow over time? So we met at Oxford. He was a Rhodes Scholar at, at that stage. And then he was at CSFB when I was with Jim in New York. And then we came back to Australia, him in Melbourne at CSFB and me working at that stage for Hellman and Friedman. And we had these, what we would call, had to gunner conversations. Somebody felt like they were getting, you know, had no alternative, they had to make the thing. And then the other guy was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. <laughs> and finally, after 10 years of talking, we actually did it. 
And then the business, what were the major appointments that you worked on between that period from 2000 to 2007? I mean, there were so many different ones and stuff like that. There were a whole... I mean, the important things in my view were meeting Don Luke, who is currently my chairman, now also chairman of the combined... soon to be the chairman of the combined Q-Super, um, Sun Super thing. We did, you know, all sorts of interesting deals for Colesmeyer, Westfield, um, Qantas, etc. But big ticket advisory was a really interesting chapter, but I have to say it's not what I would want to do with my life. Leading up to the GFC, you sold the business to Lazard in mm -hmm. 2007 for a, for a good figure. What key indicators did you look for prior to the GFC? Did you see it coming? Well, it's a bit like now, which is it's absolutely crazy at the moment, yeah? But you can't figure out where the whale in the bay is, yeah? Like, you've got interest rates at free to they pay you in the short end, 150 on the 10 year or 169 on the 10 year at the moment, yeah? Mm -hmm. The Fed just saying we're going to do whatever it takes for another at least 12, not even talking about tightening, and yet you sit here and Katie Page was sitting, Katie Harvey mm -hmm. was sitting in this, um, in that chair behind you today talking about how much wage inflation is going to come. So. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to stay the way it is at the moment, but that's all fine and dandy to be sitting there and saying it ain't going to be the way it is at the moment. The part that's really, really hard for me to figure out is how's it going to change, mm -hmm. yeah? Because um, there's been decade-long periods where government policy has not worked. Everyone thinks they intervened, they did this, they kept us safe, it's worked, yeah? But look at the 70s. It just didn't work. It wasn't like they weren't trying. They just could not figure out and could not get hold of it. Let's discuss your current business, MH Carnegie & Co, which you launched in 2011 and it now has over $900 million of funds under management. You invest in a range of platforms, one being medical devices, the other being fast-moving mm -hmm. consumer goods, and you've also invested in operating real estate investments in the past as well. What has been the most rewarding investments, do you think, for either the business or for yourself personally? Psychologically or financially? Psychologically. Psychologically, for me, the medical device stuff. I mean, we've got a moonshot on Alzheimer's I could talk all day about mm -hmm. that it, with a person who, you know, is a great friend, another Oxford friend, really, you know, profoundly excited about that. Um, I like the portfolio of what we've got in medical devices in terms of overall how they're going to end up doing financially and also they're going to be great in terms of making the world a better place because they'll be better things for human beings in terms of longevity and health. So I really, really like that portfolio. I like the crypto because, as I say, I think the what those guys are seeking to do, whether they achieve it or not, is a big, big question. Mm -hmm. But those guys, they are trying to do something really, really important, which is to take back control from all of these centralised um, networks and these regulatory insanities and if they succeed or even if the incumbents just adjust i think that's going to be hugely important then i've got a piece on sort of regenerative agriculture the biome mm -hmm. fermentation which is really a hobby at the moment it's not a business but i get a sense that something's coming on that at the moment it just feels like leeches and uh, alchemy and mm -hmm. rubbish but there's something more there you just can't see the numbers that are coming out of regen agriculture and some of the early studies coming out of the biome and not feel like you're going to find something that was hiding in plain sight there. You've also led a number of successful real estate ventures across the hospitality and marina asset classes in particular with Greg Paramore, yep. Brett Blundy and John Singleton. Tell me about some of your most significant or successful investments in the real estate arena. I know there was the Sydney Super Yacht Marina I think you yep. were invested in as well as the pubs. It's just, been a, it's just been a happy asset class for me since Lloyd and the pubs, the Scottish and Newcastle pubs in Australia. It's just people want to buy an industrial piece of land, people want to buy a shopping centre, people want to buy a piece of residential stuff. The tweener stuff pubs, marinas, caravan parks, self-storage facilities, EQ. It's not a box, right? Mm -hmm. And 
they can't get their hands around it. So in a shitty market, it trades like a business, and in a good market, it's like, oh, it's a growing real estate asset class, and it gets priced to perfection on yields. So I've liked it. Uh, it's not like I've been sitting there and thinking I got put on earth to do operating real estate, but it's been a fantastic source of alpha for us across a number of investments. In regard to MH Carnegie and Co, do you have a targeted rate of return or a time frame where you enter and then exit investments? So the answer is it's all risk adjusted. So what you you know what you'd expect from crypto is completely different to what you're expecting from a stretch senior piece of debt that we arrange for people. Mm -hmm. So big big components are, you know, risk adjusted returns rather than absolute returns. The golden question, in regard to your investment philosophy, what are the fundamentals that you look at prior to investing in anything? So what I say to people is capital, money, is a commodity. So you have to do one of two things to actually just basic level business. You have to do one of two things. You've got to provide it in a point of local scarcity that are frozen markets, yeah, where for whatever reasons a market's got locked up and there isn't capital there. Whether that was Indonesian television stations after Suharto died or days when crypto seizes up and has a flash crash, yeah, or medical devices in the US, I tend to like one category of stuff, which is local scarcity, mm. yeah. The second bucket is, I think people can manufacture capital into a solution, yeah? Get into a complicated thing and you end up with a different set of economic outcomes if you're able to take the capital, some ideas and other things and manufacture an outcome. And I do that. I don't pretend to be an industrialist. There's a whole lot of people in private equity who claim to be better managers of businesses than me. Oh, sorry, of the people who are currently running them. That is not me. A couple of questions to finish. You've been vocal in the past about issues such as wealth inequality and inheritance taxes. What are the major, economics, major economic reforms you'd like to see in Australia over the next five years? I think the whole more tax on the rich is coming. So uh, reiterating, it might be that Morrison's sitting there and gets through one more election by ch before he changes his tune on that, but I don't see any way out of what we've created without a sort of 30 to 50% shakedown of rich people, yeah? How long that takes and how much you paralyse the world while you're getting to that outcome, I don't really know, yeah? Maybe it's a three-year quick thing, I th don't think so. It feels to me like more it's a sort of decade to a decade and a half of this interventionist experiment, which I feel very, very pessimistic about the long-term outcome. So I like the idea that you shake down the rich and quickly get a big chunk off them and start the capitalist game going again. But that has just, as Piketty says, not been the mechanism where these things get sorted out. Interventionist policies tend to happen very, very slowly, very timidly. Then rich, smart people hire smart lawyers and smart accountants to adjust and the whole perverse incentives game starts playing. So that's one. And then I think if we're genuinely deciding to jump into bed with an ally that can't even figure out what it's doing itself in America, we are in all sorts of trouble there. I, if I was sitting there and saying, I don't like the Chinese, and clearly the voters don't, then you want to be trying to find some way to do way more than people are with India and Japan mm. um, and the rest of Asia and the non-aligned people and find some proper moral path leadership for a third way. So that'd be my big, big deal at the moment, which is I don't think the Chinese authoritarianism is at all appealing to Australians and, or New Zealanders, nor should it be. But I also think we have had Trump and all those other people with him creating crazy, crazy policy. You can't believe that's a reliable ally. So let's find a common cause amongst the Indonesians, the Indians, the Japanese, and find some third way path through this. You're an active participant on Twitter, a very divisive platform. What do you like about it? 
It's just a really, really quick way to read 100 or 200 magazines. Mm. Just, it's so efficient to get through just a tonne of news and information. And if you've got a reasonably well curated list of both sides, sure, you'll get 10 tweets about X and waste too much time on that. But overall, you get some really, really interesting ideas from it. You've said previously that a massive amount of negotiation in Australia starts on the basis that the other person's uh, clueless. Let's let's go with that. How do you approach negotiation and what are the keys involved? Well, I, yeah, I don't understand why this Australian thing happens all the time, where surely basic level of negotiation, which is that you know before you're going in what the other person's next best alternative is, right? Isn't that rule one, week one? please figure out what the next best alternative is and then try and move to yes in any one of the negotiating textbooks, yeah? But the idea that somebody puts a bit on a screen which is manifestly worse than your next best alternative and you spend three months getting back to where you would have been just seems to me to be a massive amount of wasted product, Australian productivity. You've also been quoted as saying, relationships are very much a defining feature of what I do. I have a very small number of deep relationships. What are the benefits from a business perspective of focusing on quality relationships rather than quantity? Well, I think you just get conned less. You know? mm. Just the people who are good at selling and making you know, early impressions very seldom end up being able to pass through. And you know, I just... Business, I tend to find, is a marathon, not a sprint. And so I'm looking for people who I can learn, grow with, develop with, deal with the problems that inevitably come up. What does it take to become successful, in your view? Well, isn't that the great John Paul Getty line about rise early, strike oil? <laughs> <laughs> Work hard, get lucky. I mean, look, I was an immensely privileged guy. I came from this set of circumstances. I can take you to an example in Barotsi land where there's a guy who clearly is every bit as smart as me, absolutely fantastic. He's doing a fantastic small business job there. He cannot get out of that box. Mm -hmm. Culturally, education-wise, access to scale, anything, the culture will just absolutely squash him. But Buffett and Gates make the same point, which is, hey, the biggest of the lucky sperm club is living in a place like Australia where you've genuinely got decent opportunity. I managed to get the cherry on top of a huge amount of privilege on top of that. But compared to a whole lot of the world, historically, they've just had no chance. And what I think crypto plus fintech is going to be able to do, plus bandwidth being essentially infinite and free over the next decade, is put a whole lot of self-orienting systems into rural communities around the world and you're going to be stunned by what you find from all of these different places. So I'm pessimistic for the rich billion and a massively optimistic for the poor six billion over the next decade. My final question, you've played nearly all the bases over your career. Is there any sector, asset class or investment that you wouldn't go near or wouldn't touch? Mm, I'm a bit like Buffett. The airline business, no good. The shipping business, anything that's got... I mean, the five factors... Sorry, it's a long question for the wind-up, but, you know, Porter's five factors, there are things that just have huge, huge structural problems. When you've got a tax and government-sponsored supplier into your industry, that is just going to breed structural overcapacity and there's nothing you can do to save it. Mark Carnegie, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Don't be silly, Rob. Thank you.